Well, look, when I was a boy, I remember hopping out of a car and stepping straight onto a bee quite a number of times, actually. I never learnt my lesson. In fact, I remember being fascinated and pretty scared of bees, and they were all over the place when I was growing up. They were always hanging around the weeds in the backyard. And while I was watching my own boy playing barefoot the other day, it made me realise something's really changed. I don't really see bees buzzing around very often anymore. And then when I hit Google, I started reading some really disturbing stuff. There are many scientists who believe bees are on their way to extinction. And it might be caused by things like pesticides or even telecommunication towers, which may disorientate the bee, making it unable to find its way back to the hive. Now, Gail Abitoni joins me tonight. She is an amateur beekeeper from the Kendall Garden Club. G'day, Gail. How are you? Hi, Tim. So what's the story, Gail? Are, Are bees really endangered? I don't know whether they're so much endangered, but they're definitely under threat. Um, Everybody's sort of been noticing that they're disappearing or they're not seeing as many around. All over, from here to Sydney, I know people who keep saying, we just don't see the bees anymore. So I'm not alone. You're not alone. No, no. I know when we first came here, a lot of people around Kendall said they weren't seeing near the amount of bees they used to. Right. And what's the cause of that? Well, there's there's a number of reasons. I mean, the worst is small hive beetle. There's the increased use of pesticides and, mm. you know, all those sort of insecticides, fungicides. So there's, it's like multiple reasons. Yeah, you can't there's, pin it down. there's multiple reasons. Um, there's even another big factor is um, the loss of nesting sites with all the clearing of the trees. They're like all the other parrots, possums and all the rest. When the trees get cleared, that's, that's for feral bees, which... There's a lot of feral bees in Australia. I just read that Einstein, and you know, when Einstein talks, Gail, I listen. Uh, Einstein apparently once said that if the bees disappear, mankind would only have four more years of life. So in the context of what, (laughs) you know, we're talking about tonight, that's fairly scary stuff. Just how important are bees? I don't know. I haven't haven't heard that one. I have heard that if all the bees disappeared, we would certainly lose something like, I don't know if it's a third or two thirds of all our food. Is that right? So so tell it, why are bees so important? Well, I mean, apart from pollinating the flowers and making honey, Mm -hmm. they pollinate pollinate all the crops, the uh, veggies, fruit trees, nut trees. So, I mean, they are incredibly important. If they were to disappear, our food crops would be cut dramatically. So European honeybees that are managed, they've got their problems, but the feral bees, we've got the biggest, the largest density of feral bees in the world. So a lot of the farmers are lucky because a lot of the crops are actually pollinated just by the feral bees. You talk about seeing them when they used to be in the clover and everything. Yes. That's right. They are just your feral bees that live in the, you know, the trees and... They aren't managed by anybody. Mm. But, um, but even those, they're, they're, they're even seem to be more scarce than well, they were. Well, yeah. they are. Yeah. They're, they're, their biggest threat at the moment has been small hive beetle. It first appeared here in 2002 from so, Africa. So small hive beetle, what does it look like? It's a horrible little beetle mm. which travels on the back of the bee. It goes into the hive. It eats away the hive, it eats away the larva, it wow. eats away the eggs. It totally destroys them. Wow, it sounds like a cunning little it's insect. A, it's a horrible little beetle. It even attacks a native bee. We actually have lost a hive here of native bees to small hive beetles. Is that right? But some of the beekeepers reckon it's upwards of 20% of the bees, feral bees, have been lost to small hive beetle already. Can anything be done about small hive beetle? Oh, they must be very small. No, they're not that. They're if not, they travel on the back of the they bee, they do travel on the back of the bee. Yeah, I suppose they're small, but then I mean, I think of a, a normal bee as a big, quite a big bee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they've they've tried chemical traps. They're trying all sorts of things with them. So people are working on yeah. it. Yeah, mm. I mean, then on on top of that, we've got the Asian bee, which they've now found up in northern Queensland. It's heading this way. Mm. It's going to certainly cause problems. It it's a lot more aggressive bee. It's got a lot wider foraging. Area. So it's a foreign bee. It's an Asian bee. But so yeah. let me let me just get this straight. The Asian bee, which you're saying is affecting Queensland currently. Well, do, yeah. how, how does it affect the native bees? Does it well, sabotage them? No, no, it, it hasn't. It hasn't affected our native bees yet. See, the Asian bee that they're starting to find up north, they're trying to eradicate. It's in cans and places like that. That's going to have its own problems because it carries all sorts of mites. It competes with the honeybees. Right. It competes with the native bees as well, but it really competes with the... And they're quite aggressive, you say? They're, they're more aggressive, yeah. Mm. And then they're worried to it also carries a mite, which is what 
a lot of people, especially the experts, think is going to be the biggest threat to Australia is varroa mite. Now, can you just pronounce that again for me? Varroa, varroa mite. mite. And yeah. this is a problem overseas this, already. This is every honey-producing country in the world has got varroa mite except Australia. Wow. It's in New Zealand. It's rampant in New Guinea now. And so there's this doomsday scenario in Australia where we think, well, it's just a matter of time. <laughs> is, that, is that right? Oh, it's definitely, yeah. That, they're not saying anymore if it comes to Australia. It's a matter of when it comes to Australia. Mm. So they're, they're trying to find, they're trying to do research to stop it. They're trying to do it in America. In America, they've, I mean, they've had massive losses. And what exactly is it? It's, it's just a, it's another horrible little mite mm. <laughs> that totally, it totally destroys the it, it, it destroys the hive altogether. So it gets into the hive. It gets into the and hive. Just destroys it, again, it from the inside out. Yeah, it, it's mm. carried into the hive. It can be carried. It can be carried on the on the backs of the bees. Mm. They take it in. It attacks everything. It eats everything. I mean, I personally, I just think there should have been a lot more research done earlier. It's not Clearly. like we haven't had time. Mm. I mean, if they've known since the 1950s. But it's and it snuck up on us, and now it's yeah. now it's that would be the number one global. That will cause. be that's the number one global problem. That's why we we actually export bees. A lot of bees were going from Australia to America to pollinate their crops right. because they suffered massive losses. Um, oh no, it it really is. A, it's sort of a major problem with it. They've been using chemicals, but the every but, time they get a chemical, they get used to it. Mm. They're trying to find ways to breed in bees that are resistant to the varroa mite mm. but that's having limited success sure sure so it it really is it is the biggest it really is the biggest problem. and you know what gail i noticed even the united nations has weighed into this it, it expressed alarm at what they call quote the huge decline in bee colonies and they talked of quote a multiple onslaught of pests and pollutions as you were saying do you think most people are even aware of the problems facing bees around the world and in Australia? No, I don't think so, especially not in Australia anyway. Mm. I really don't think people realise. I mean, people don't realise if they do something simple as go out and spray something. If it's in flower, the bees will be affected by it. Is that... Whether it's native bees or whether it's the, the normal bees. Mm. You, spray, you spray anything that's in flower with any sort of um, insecticide, you know, you are going to affect whatever goes on it. And if, you, and if people do use sprays, I mean, a lot of the time there's natural alternatives, mm -hmm. which sometimes work and sometimes don't. Yeah. But at least if, you, if something has to be sprayed, do it when it's not in flower. You've spoken about the fact we have our own species of bees here in Australia. Can you tell us a bit about those? Oh, definitely. That, they're, they're my pet things. I, I'm not... This is your pet <laughs> that's, topic, that's my, isn't it, my interest <laughs> is the native bees. I mean, I know a, a little bit about the other one, you know, the normal honeybees but no the, the, the native ones are my special lot a lot of ignorant people like me go only thought there were honeybees <laughs> in this world so you're about to educate us well there's, a, there's about 2,000 native Australian bees and actually if you ever look on a flower and you see a bee on it and it's not a honeybee it is one of ours they vary in size from a tiny little 2 mil up to about 25 mil long wow um, That's a big bee, isn't it? 25 mil? Oh, yeah. 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 And he, there's quite a few of them around here. And do you think people would even recognise them if they happened to buzz around your garden? Not, your garden? No, not, not always. The little tiny ones. Um, there, there, there's, sort of three, there's three types of Australian bees. There's what you call social, where they live together in hives. Mm -hmm. There's about a dozen social bees in Australia. They'll live in colonies. They do produce honey and wax. Not a lot of it, though. Only about a kilo a year. So Australian honey is a delicacy. Oh, it's lovely, yeah. It's, yeah, it's nice. But yeah. like I say, you don't get a lot of it off them. Does it taste very different from what the honey that we buy in the stores that most of us have in our cupboard? Not a lot different. It tastes like a bit more mentholated taste. Oh, okay, it's right. It's more... You could tell they're getting it. It's, it, it tastes like they're getting it from gum trees. Oh, is that <laughs> it's right? It's got that taste to it, yeah. Oh, it sounds like a natural flavour. Yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. It, it's, it's good. That's no, nice. Very good. But um, And out of the social bees that live in... Actually, they're, they're also referred to as stingless bees because they can't sting. Our bees can't sting. Our, good on our, them. Not, no, not all of them, though. No, um, not all only of them. our social bees, our little, uh, our little ones. Our, well, our they're ones social that, after all. That's right. Yes. They're lovely to keep. They <laughs> make nice little pets. <laughs> um, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're 
the ones that live around here, the only ones actually that live as far south as here are called Trigona carbonaria. Okay. TCs for short. Very good. I'm impressed by that. <laughs> so you're as an amateur beekeeper, do you keep some of these yeah, social bees we've, we've yourself? Got, yes, we've got a few hives of native bees. Down there in Kendall? Down, well, we're just east of, east of Kew. Oh, so really we're heading yeah. towards Loretton that way. But a nice yeah. natural place to do it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But there is, a, there is a lot of native bees around here. We see them. Um, and as I say, if you go into a nursery when it's a nice sunny day you'll see these little tiny black bees. And once you know what they are, you'll start to see them everywhere. Some of them look like flies, don't they? They do look a little bit like flies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but we shouldn't swap them. <laughs> no, we shouldn't swap them, no. now, and, you've got to be very, and, and you don't go and spray them thinking they're some horrible little... Bug, because you know, they're actually horrible, helping your garden. They are definitely helping the garden, very good. yeah. So then, tell, tell us about some of your favourite Australian bees. Well, besides them, then you've got uh, semi, what they call semi-social bees. Right, semi-social. We're, semi-social. Sounds like me. Yeah, where two or more females will share a burrow or a, a hole or however they work it right and then after that you've got your solitary bees most of, most of our bees are solitary bees right and some of those solitary bees can sting oh yeah yeah okay. they they don't though i mean i very very rarely have you ever heard of anybody being stung by one are there any in particular that are inter- are really particularly interesting that you can tell us about oh there's a lot of there's a lot of really nice ones but the ones that the ones that you mainly see around here um i'll just say sort of briefly mm-hmm. you have reed bees which are only a they're only a fairly small bee about eight mil long mm-hmm. and they've got a little red abdomen right. so you see this little red body that's a little reed bee um we have blue banded bees which you can't mistake them because they've got the blue stripes. Blue stripes. And they make a louder they make a louder buzz than a honeybee. Mm. They're a bit smaller than a honeybee, but they make a louder buzz. Um, and they're furrier. furrier. You can sort of see the fur on wow. them. It's, it's a real pretty blue. Mm. Then you've got teddy bear bees. I love the sound of that. I'm yeah. sure I'm sure everybody <laughs> hones in on that. It's a nice well, name. Well, a lot of people have told me they've seen them around Kendall too. They're like the colour of a teddy bear, bit bigger than a than a honeybee. And they're nice and furry. They're, they're sort of, lovely. They're almost a bit shaped like a teddy bear. You showed me a yeah. picture of a teddy bear bee. And yeah, <laughs> yeah I there can, they are. You, you, yeah. As soon as you see them, you know why they're... I mean, that's their, their names. They're common names. They're nicknames. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got cuckoo bees, cuckoo which cuckoo bees. bees, like their name suggests, they wait and they watch the blue bandits and the teddy bear bees get their hole just ready because they tend to live in um, clay or in mud, in, in tunnels. Right. And you'll watch the you'll watch the cuckoo bee. She'll hover around there and she'll duck in and she'll have a look. And when the blue bandit bees get there, they put a little bit of pollen in there and a little bit of nectar. And when they get it just right to lay their egg, the cuckoo bee shoots in and lays her egg. Oh, very clever. Which unfortunately, of course, when it hatches out, which usually hatches out before the blue bandit bee, it will either eat it. <laughs> some species eat them, or other species just eat the food supply. So either way, it's not a good. Well, that's nature, but, though, isn't but it? But they are a beautiful coloured iridescent blue bee. Wow. But really, you ever see one, you'll never forget them. They are a really metallic blue furry-looking bee. Okay. They're, they are around here. I've seen them. You know, Gail, as, as you talk, I, I can hear the... I can hear the passion in your voice about bees, and that's fantastic. And I especially love having people who have a particular passion come into this program. But what is it about bees that really draws you in? What is it that fascinates you about bees? I don't know. I think it's just that there's so many. There's so many different things. I, I'm an animal lover of all sorts, though. Sure. But you, even even the wasps here. I've never been so aware of wasps and things like that. But the bees, they. They're there. I mean, too often they're taken for granted. Sure, I agree with that. Until you ever look, until the first time I saw a blue bandit and didn't know what it was and went and Googled it and found the Australian native bee site and then found all these other remarkable bees and found a huge colony of blue bandits nesting under our bathroom in Sydney because we're up off the ground. Wow. Um, There's... There's a lot of unu- there's so many unusual things amongst them. There's wasp mimic bees, which when you first see them, you would swear that it's a wasp because they look just like a wasp. Um, there's a leaf cutter bee. Now we've got leaf cutter bees, and if you ever see a perfect, like little half circle cut out of particularly rose bushes, that is a leaf cutter. Now the leaf cutter she likes to build in soft mortar. And what she does is she goes and she cuts out a cuts out half a leaf. She takes it back. She puts it in. She cuts out another half a leaf, and basically, she weaves like a little cradle. She goes in. She puts the pollen. She puts the nectar. She lays the egg, 
and then she seals it up with another piece of cut leaf. Wow. So I mean, they're th- and she, to see she them works doing, hard. yeah, they work incredibly hard. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and once you see that, and actually once you realise too that that's what's cutting holes in in certain leaves, then you think you wondered how anything could cut leaves that nice and perfectly even, but they're different sizes, some of them. Because they have to fit together. And you, you therefore, <laughs> must appreciate the holes in your leaves now rather than worry about them. Yeah? Yeah. yeah? Oh, definitely. Oh, that's De- good definitely. stuff. So no. what about, uh, just finally, Gail, is there anything us everyday Joe Schmoes can do, you know, to rescue or to save the bee? For example, is it true to say that planting native trees and shrubs, is that a help at all? Well, I'm more partial to native, to the native plants and the native trees and that. Mm. I mean, saying that... I know if you want bees around, I always say to somebody, we'll plant a perennial basil, and if there are bees around, they will come on it, all bees. Right. Every bees love love basil. Okay. And as far as, I mean, cutting down, obviously trying to cut down as much as you can on using all the different sorts of sprays is always good. Yeah, yeah. Um, And if there's a tree that's dead or dying and there's a hollow in it, Leave you know, it if it alone. can be left there. Yeah. yeah because, our, our, I mean... The, the and a lot of our native bees also live in hollows like the like the feral bees do. You're talking to a city boy who's only just realised in the past few years that a dead tree is a very useful tree. Oh yeah. I didn't know that and I'm ashamed of myself, but now I understand the importance and bees just another one of the many reasons why dead trees are so important. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, yeah. I th- I think that's probably one of the biggest tragedies of all that so many trees now are cleared and it does it's unreal just how many things it does affect, mm. including the bees. Now, Gail, thank you for coming in tonight. I really appreciate it. I've, look, I've, you've made me passionate about bees. I'm going to go and plant a perennial basil bush now because I want bees on my balcony. We can only hope, I suppose, that you know we, people uh, are more aware of, of bees. And so that, that's a starting point, I suppose, well, that's for, right. for saving the bee. Yeah. Thank you for your time tonight. Thanks very much for having me on. And if you'd like to make a comment to our listeners at home, you can, get, you can do that, 6585. 3456. This is the Times Talk program.